Hello everyone, I am Loïc Barbeau, professor of navigation in the French Maritime Academy and doctorate in the French Laboratory for Astrophysics in Marseille. The core of my thesis consists in studying the possibility to build a stellar positioning system combining a light detector and an inertial sensor to measure the vertical direction of gravity. Star tracking is already used to measure the attitude angles of a satellite, for example, or a stratospheric balloon, or can be used to measure a position or to align the axis of gyroscopes inside an inertial system of navigation, like for aircrafts or missiles. This is an emergency method of navigation for a ship or for an aircraft using a sextant. In this presentation, we will first remind the main principle of uh, celestial navigation, how to measure the attitude angles thanks to a star tracker on a satellite. In the second part, we will explain how the light can cross the atmosphere. This is a radiative transfer. In the third part, we will focus on the main characteristics of the stars and then study the available systems of uh, light detection, the main technologies. To end, we will uh, give some results of our pending tests. So first of all, let's remind the main principle of uh, celestial navigation. When navigating with the sextant from uh, an aircraft or from a ship, we observe a single star and measure the angle between the horizon line and the direction of this star. Or we can use an inclinometer, an inertial sensor, to measure this angle between the zenith and the direction of this star. In this case, the identification of the single star is made by the observer comparing the position of this star inside a constellation or identifying on a sky map this sky map can be designed by a computer for the present position of the observer. It means that we need to have an approximate position, usually calculated with dead reckoning navigation. The position of our ship is somewhere on a circle. The circle is all the places of the world from where we can observe the same star at the same time on the same altitude angle on the sextant above the local horizon. This circle can be projected on a Mercator chart, and if we focus around our position, this circle looks like a straight line. The line of position on the nautical chart is drawn like a straight line. If we observe two stars, we have two straight lines and an intersection, and usually we use a third observation to get a third line and have an intersection like a triangle. On another hand, we can use celestial observation to measure the altitude angles of a satellite, for example, or a stratospheric balloon. In this case, the star tracker is a camera taking a picture of the celestial sphere in a direction far from the sun or the moon to avoid being bloomed by the high flux of their light. Notification is automatically made and we have many stars on the same picture. We will now describe how the light will cross our atmosphere. Science is describing this phenomena of transfer of energy with equations of radiative transfer that is implemented in many codes, like Motron or others. To understand what happens, I propose you to follow the trajectory of a photon. This photon is born in a star and will propagate through the space and the time toward the Earth and our eye or the lens of our camera. Crossing the space, the trajectory and the wavelengths of this photon are not changed or barely not. But arriving in the top atmosphere, we will encounter many phenomena that will change either the direction or the wavelengths of this photon. First, the turbulences are created in high atmosphere by strong wind that will slightly change the direction of the photon. And the second effect is the refraction. The last effect is the scattering. Scattering is like a reflection on a small mirror that will change the direction of the incoming photon to many other directions. Other effects are creating and the death of our photon. For example, 
many uh, molecules are able to absorb the energy of this photon, changing it into heat or uh, motion, or increasing the level of energy inside the molecule, creating the motions of uh, stretching or bending or spinning. And this energy may be released by fluorescence after a short time, creating another photon with a lower energy, meaning a longer wavelength. Along the trajectory of our photon, other photons may propagate. They have been transmitted by another celestial body, like the Moon or the Sun. But they have suffered the same phenomena, and their final trajectory is toward our sensor. So, we are not able to separate photons of our star and photons from the Sun or from the Moon. In infrared wavelengths, we have an additional effect of thermal emission. Because of temperature higher than 20 degrees, the thermal emissions of atmosphere behaving like a black body are more important and on wavelengths more than 1.5 micron, we have an additional source of photons inside the atmosphere. All these phenomena are depending on the altitude, because density of the air, the pressure, depending on the composition of this atmosphere, if we have additional chemical spaces, pollution, if we have aerosols, dusts, grains of pollen, and above all, the amounts of water. These phenomena are much more important for some bands of the spectrum and lower for other wavelengths. If the weather is bad with snow or rain, or when the sky is covered by clouds or fog or sandstorm, it's impossible to observe stars and the stellar positioning system is not available. Like for GPS signal when fading because of stellar activities in the South Atlantic magnetic anomaly. To conclude about the atmosphere, it means that we have to take in account on the spectrum of absorption that we have remaining windows of transmission where it's possible to observe the star. In these windows, we have separated in different bands with names. This is a photometric system using BVR for visible light, I for near infrared wavelengths, and JHK for short infrared wavelengths. We will add behind our telescope and before our sensor filters to get rid of the bands of absorption where we lose the photons of our star and where we may be bloomed by the phenomena of propagation in the atmosphere. And only observe inside windows of transmission where we still may observe the stars. Now let's focus on the stars and their characteristics. A star behaves like a black body and the spectrum of transmission of a star shows a maximum flux for uh, wavelengths. This wavelength depends on the surface temperature of the star. Let's have a look at Deneb and Antares. Deneb looks like a blue star and the temperature is very high. The maximum of its flux is in the UV. In the opposite for Antares, we have a lower temperature on the surface. It looks like a red star and the curve of transmission has maximum in the red color of the visible spectrum or the near infrared spectral band. It's important to take that in account because stars have never the same flux in all the spectral bands. Some are very faint in visible light and very shiny in infrared spectral bands. About the number of stars we can detect. With our naked eyes, we can see 170 stars that are sorted in the nautical almanac, but if you look at them through the telescope of the sextant, you lose some flux because of the lens, and this number falls to 80. This corresponds approximately to the magnitude limit 3 and 2.8. Keeping the same limit, magnitude 3, the number of stars we can observe in the near infrared bands, the I bands, we have 900 detectable stars. And in the shortwave infrared, the J band, 2000 stars or H and K band, approximately 6000 stars. The number of stars is increasing 
if the magnitude limit is increasing, that depends on the sensitivity of our detector and optical design, and if the wavelength of observation is increasing, privileging the infrared observation. This number of detectable stars will draw a limit between single and multi-star observation. Choosing a spectral band where we have few stars to detect, we are condemned to a single star observation, meaning that we need to know an approximate position of our ship and an approximate direction of our camera pointing toward the celestial sphere. But if we choose a spectral band where we have a high number of detectable stars, we will be able to manage an automatic identification of the spotlights as stars by an algorithm and even to measure the attitude angles in only one shot. One word about the accuracy. The better accuracy is given with a narrow field of view and a high number of pixels. But we have to take in account the number of detectable stars with the spectral bands. On these curves, I have assumed that the distribution of stars on the celestial sphere is homogeneous. That is not true in reality. And calculated the number of stars we can see in different fields of view, one by one, two by two, and so on. The result is that to observe a minimum of one star in visible light, we need a field of view of 8 by 8 degrees. But in infrared, H and K bands, we need only a field of view of 2 by 2 degrees. With this course, we can see that there is a compromise between the field of view we have chosen and the magnitude limit. Magnitude limit is given by the sensitivity of the sensors, and we can hope that with the improvement of the technology, we will push back this limit. The field of view is mainly depending on the single or multi-star observations we want to do. If we have a strapped-down camera moving with the vehicle, rolling or pitching, we can suppose that the camera will scan different areas and after a few seconds we can have one single star in the field of view. But if this vehicle is not rolling or pitching or yawing, maybe we will spend a few seconds or minutes without observing a single star because we have seen many areas of the celestial sphere where we have no star, even in H and K band. If we imagine a pointable system, we will be able to choose different areas in the celestial sphere and be sure to have one or more stars. We can even choose areas of the, of the sky where we have a better transmission. The problem of such pointable system is that you will add new errors with the mechanisms. Looking for an accuracy of 30 meters, we need an optical accuracy of one arc second. And such accuracy for a gimbal system is very difficult to reach, except with a high price. Knowing the limits given by the radiative transfer through the atmosphere on one hand and the detectable stars on another hand, we will now have a look at the main technologies for light detectors. To begin, the silicon technology. This is a very famous technology and it has been boosted by the business of private cameras and smartphones. The price is now very low. The performance are very good and above all the definition the high number of pixels along the horizontal and vertical axis, and the pixel size that is very small, 5 to 3 microns. This is one of the main parameters to have a good accuracy when measuring an angular distance between two spots of light on the same picture. The working temperature is a good asset. Uh, this is the ambient temperature. The drawback of this technology to measure stars by day consisting first the few stars we can observe in a visible or near infrared wavelengths and secondly we have to increase the signal to noise ratio by optimizing the parameters with the radiative transfer simulation choosing an area of the sky where we have the best transmission as possible and use a high aperture widening the primary lens or primary mirror and a long focal distance after the picture, we need a steep post-processing, uh, working with a burst of pictures 
to dig a contrast and detect one or maybe a second star if we have used a wide field of view. The second technology is indium gallium arsenide, detecting the stars between 0.9 and 1.7 micron. In this short wave infrared wavelengths, we have detectors that are limited in definitions and for the same definition, the price is 15 times more expensive than the silicon technology. But the definition is a parameter that could be enhanced in the coming years because technology is very promising. And even the pixel size for the moment between 15 and 10 micron could be shortened, but we have a physical limit. If the pixel size is equal to the wavelengths, we cannot detect the photons. The main drawback of this technology is the working temperature, because even if the camera is in ambient temperature, the sensor needs to be cooled with a thermoelectrical cooler, like a Peltier system, one or two Peltier to save 20 to 40 degrees to have a better efficiency. A third technology does exist based on a mercury cadmium telluride, but the price is very expensive and it needs to be cooled at a low temperature with a cryostar, with nitrogen or helium, though the price for the moment is not affordable to imagine an application in a well-spread stellar positioning system. To end, a few words about the test we have done. Using a Zeiss lens of 300 millimeters of focal lens and an aperture number of four, we have used an Inga sensor of between 0.9 and 1.6 meters plus different filters. The definition is 640 by 512 pixels. Each pixel has a size of 15 microns. The um, resulting field of view is 1.8 multiplied by 1.5 degrees. We have seen Capella and Vega by clear day, approximately at 11 in the morning. But on the infrared pictures, we can see clouds that were invisible with the eyes and the trajectory of insects or a wide disk, gray disk, probably the scattered light by a grain of pollen. And insects or the grain of pollen are moving, so it's possible to get rid of them after a post-processing. This first test of detection has shown that the signal-to-noise ratio is not the same in the different bands, but is very sensitive to the time of exposure and the filters we use. So it has convinced us to continue this test using a um, sphere lens designed with specific coatings to avoid uh, reflections to increase the flux we may lose with uh, an optical design and to test it in uh, other bands like uh, H or K. Considering the magnitude of uh, Capella and Vega, we have a number of stars that have the same magnitude or lower on the celestial sphere, equal to 30 in the J band and to 90 in H or K band approximately. So we can compare that to the 80 stars we can observe with naked eyes through a telescope of a sextant. And the further step consists in using a best sphere design to increase the number of stars by detecting uh, two or three more magnitude orders. As a conclusion, I hope I have convinced you to go on looking toward the stars by night or why not by day. And for us, our simulation and first test have convinced us that a stellar receiver may be built in the coming years with an accuracy of 100 meters or better. Even if technology improvements allow an affordable device, this stellar positioning system requests a deep optimization of radiative transfer and a picture post-processing to have good efficiency. By bad weather, this stellar positioning system is not available. Such light detector combined to an inertial sensor allows the measure of the position and of the attitude of its vehicle as well, and even of universal time. Thank you for your attention.